All right, then let's start this event. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our um, final open NLP event uh, of this year. So my name is Julian. I'm the moderator of tonight's event. Um, for this meetup tonight, we have two talks scheduled. Uh, the first one is by Marty Olschläger. Olschläger, he is talking about ethics and natural language processing. And the second one is by Sarah Sanzotra um, about a practical introduction to image retrieval. So the schedule of this is we'll have 30 minutes for each of the talks, uh, with, um, maybe like five minutes in the end for Q&A. But of course, you can also ask your questions after the talk in the chat. And then after both talks, so after about one hour, we have Zoom breakout rooms. So we will like form smaller groups where you can more closely interact with each other, uh, introduce yourselves, ask questions, exchange ideas, and so on and so on. And um, this meeting is being recorded. So if you want to um, keep your camera turned off, that's totally fine. The recording will later be available on, on YouTube for all the people who can't join us uh, tonight. And yeah, with all these introductory words, um, I would like to introduce the first speaker. So Marty Oeschläger um, is working at Dieter Datenschmiede and he, uh, we just talked about um, his dissertation. So he's a PhD in physics. I can't really uh, explain what he did. Uh, I tried to, to understand the abstract, but um, the topic today is anyways different. So it's about ethics in NLP and I'm super happy that you um, are here tonight, Marty. So the stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. Just let me share my screen. All right. Now you should be able to see everything, right? Yes, works. Perfect. Yeah, thank you again uh, for having me here. And um, I'm very glad to speak about this topic. Um, as you had introduced me already, I'm Marty Ulschliger. And the physics times are over since 2020, but still it's a very interesting topic. And since then I'm more orientated uh, towards machine learning. And I'm also since 2020, I work at DIDA. And I just want to briefly introduce DIDA. Um, DIDA is a small software company. We are um, slightly above 30 people there, 30 scientists. And we are mostly composed of mathematicians and physicists. Uh, we are specialized in algorithmic problem solving and custom machine learning solutions. And our main goal is basically to bridge this gap between research and industry. So on the one hand, we are publishing papers, uh, we participate in conferences and in uh, research projects. And on the other hand, uh, we work with enterprises and public institutions for hands-on custom machine learning solutions. And yeah, as I said, with this, uh, we try to bridge this gap and bring the research to practice. All right, this would be my small introduction. And my topic today is, as you already mentioned, is ethics and natural language processing. And I immediately want to dive into the topic, but first um, give a brief general overview how bias can enter our model. So more in general, and later we focus on the NLP part. All right, let's start. So when you start to collect your data, your data is probably already biased. Up. And by bias, I mean there's uh, some biases, some phenomenon that skews the results of an algorithm in favor or against an idea. So for example, a stereotype is a bias. Um, when you have the world where your data uh, normally lives, uh, then you already have some bias. You know there are, unfortunately, racist structures out there or sexist structures, and those are already biasing um, the information out there in the world. And so even if you would have your perfect strategy of getting your data and building your model, the bias is already there. So this you already have to keep in mind. But now we want to cannot recall the whole world, we uh, have to sample some information out of there. Uh, and so we should be very carefully to sample correctly, because you probably know as uh, machine learning practitioners that if you don't sample correctly, um, your sample will not represent 
the pop population from the world. And so again, you can easily introduce a bias towards certain groups if you do not sample correctly. Now you have sampled um, your samples, but still you probably um, had to measure something because most of the time we do not have the direct um, value on hand, but we have to introduce a proxy. So for example, when you want to measure performance of an individual or the goodness of an individual, um, you cannot just measure it because those are abstract, con uh, um, abstract concepts, but you can, for example, introduce monthly income or how many uh, people a person takes care of and then measure um, your act uh, value you defined before. But again, if you do not do this carefully, you can already introduce a bias. And at this point, I want to give you a small example of how this could look like. And there was a software by a company called Northpoint, and the software is called Compass. And this was used by judges and parole officers in the US to make decisions around pre-trial release. So basically, if um, an individual was said to be free or not um, pre-trial. And the software should calculate or calculated the, um, the probability if the individual will, would re-offend or not. And as proxy for crime, there was used arrests. So the number of arrests was one important predictor in this context. But the problem was that not all communities or all groups are policed the same way. So some groups, especially minority communities, where higher police had more arrests, and therefore um, this model was strongly skewed, or yeah, this data was strongly skewed uh, towards minorities. And in the end, this resulted into a model uh, which had significantly higher false positive rates for black defendants versus white defendants which is highly problematic. All right, now we have our data set, but still we want to generate our model. And so we continue to build it. And usually when you build a model, you have your train data and your test data, and uh, your model learns from the train data. And again, you can introduce a bias by just defining your object objective function or your loss function, because this will determine what the model learns and how it learns. When your objective is performance in some sense, then the model will optimize for this and not, um, not for ethical perspectives because it just um, is, is primed to do uh, the performance thing. Um, now you have built your model and the, the, how you rate your model, how well it will perform, um, you usually do with a test data set or evaluation data set. And again, when you uh, don't use this carefully, and if this evaluation data set is not representative of the whole data set, then you can again introduce an error or a bias. And here there's, for example, this, this publication by Bonabini and Gebru from 2018, uh, who th those two um, investigated on the commercial facial analysis softwares by Microsoft, IBM, and Face++. And what they basically found that their statement of the software was mostly measured on uh, male white faces and the software performed really bad on, for example, darker female faces. So this is also highly problematic when you claim that your model can do something but don't deliver the same performance for all the groups in there. And finally, you have your model and you want to deploy it. And again, you can do this um, the wrong way and introduce bias. And here I want to give one last example for this slide. Um, the deployment bias, as I just mentioned, um, race uh, comes into play when you de uh, deploy a model not in the same way as what it was thought of. And there's this example of the software Predpol, also used in the US in dozens of cities. And basically, the software was um, a crime forecast. So the city was uh, divided up into blocks, and the software 
should forecast where crime should likely is likely to occur. And the developers used this or developed this software with part one crimes in mind. And part one crimes were violent crime, crimes like homicides. Um, but most of the police stations used it for part two crimes, which was consuming small amounts of drugs or vacancy. And the problem then was that, again, different communities are differently uh, policed. And the model basically learned to predict where the crime two parts are um, and not the crime um, one parts, uh, the crime part one. And um, so basically the police officers were sent over and over again to the same blocks, which were mostly correlated to poor neighborhoods and yeah, strongly disfavored and harmed those poor neighborhoods. Before we leave the slide, there's one last thing I want to introduce. Uh, this is the feedback loop, because when you just uh, take the example I just explained to you, this can go back and forth because now the police officers go to this district or to this block and new data is generated, which is again biased and this feedback loop um, amplifies the original bias of the system, which is also highly problematic. Okay, and um, now we see that there's probably a lot of ways a bias, a bias could enter our data or model. So we probably should check who produces those models and what are the motivations of those people developing those models. And uh, here I want specifically look at uh, one publication by Behan and others from this year. And they uh, investigated the values encoded in the most highly cited ML papers from 2008 to 2009 and 2018 and 2019. And what they found was that there's a strong lack of consideration of negative impacts. When I call correctly from those 100 uh, papers they investigated, only two even considered the thinking of it could harm someone. And there's near to no focus on ethical aspects. And most of the focus is on performance and generalization and novelty. And um, this is problematic because the systems are sometimes deployed to humans, as we will see later. And uh, within the paper, there was another interesting observation, um, meaning a, a power centralization of big tech and elite universities. And to illustrate this, um, I brought the data with me. So when they looked at the affiliations of the researchers in the highly cited papers, they found that from 2008 to 2009, uh, nearly three quarters were had no corporate ties, basically. But when we look 10 years later, um, the majority is affiliated to big tech, which again correlates probably with the strong prioritization of performance generalization and mobility. All right, before we leave, the general um, investigation on ethics and machine learning, there's one last thing I want to mention. And this one last thing is scale. Because the main or crucial difference between a manual process and the algorithmic process is the scale. Because when you define an algorithmic software, um, it can probably go through huge amounts of data in no time and you can deploy this software around the globe. Um, and this can be problematic and was very interestingly laid out by Katie O'Neill in 2016 in her book, Weapons of Math Destruction. And in this book, she defined um, with a weapon of math destruction with three attributes. And those three attributes were opacity, damage, and scale. And basically, when we can check every one of this off, then we have a weapon of mass destruction. Most of the time, machine learning solutions are quite opaque, um, especially since uh, machine learning understanding is still a field in development. Then, as we already saw at the examples, there can be actual harm and damage to people. And then you can scale it up. 
to thousands and millions, which means that when you introduce some issue in your software, which harms people, then it can be scaled up. And this is really problematic. And to, to just sum up this part again, we have machine learning solutions, which are probably biased, and we apply those models in large scale. OK, just keep this in mind. And now we go and continue with NLP models. And uh, mainly, I want to focus on large NLP models. To define what is large for me is uh, those models, BERT, GPT-3, SWITCH-C, uh, which uh, were published in the recent years. And those models are trained on huge data sets. So for example, the whole English Wikipedia or the common crawl data set, which is a scraper, uh, a, a crawler which crawls through the internet and scrapes um, internet websites. Um, those models are leading the leaderboards on specific benchmarks for English language, which is good for them. And uh, they are very good in text manipulation and producing seemingly coherent output. So I would strongly argue that they do not understand what they are doing, so there's no real natural language understanding, um, but they are very good at making a seemingly coherent output. Um, and before we even look into the models or into the data sets I just mentioned, I first want to make a small detour just on the size of those models, because as you already see in this small table, the data set sizes increased quite drastically over the years, but even more so uh, did the model sizes. Um, when we look at this graphic from the Hugging Face blog, <laughs> we see that the model size in the recent years uh, basically increased by a factor of times 10 every year. So when we start with Elmo, then go to Bird, GPT-2, the Megatron, GPT-3, Megatron Turing, and I think GPT-4 is even larger. And this is quite a drastic development and quite a path we, the developers choose there. And when something in technology grows this, that quickly, and technology and those devices need energy, you probably already guess in which direction I want to go. Um, environmental impact of those technologies. And there's a very nice paper by Dutch and others uh, also from this year, which ha have done an analysis on cloud computing and the correlation to the production of CO2. And here I brought you three examples, how this looks like when you, for example, want to train or fine tune just a, bird, a small bird model. So you take the small bird model, fine tune it for uh, your use case, then you are probably in the range of driving several miles with your car compared with the CO2 emission. When you want to train a bird model from scratch, then you are in the range of burning a whole gallon of gasoline. But when you then go to a 6 billion transformer, this jumps up to uh, a range where it competes basically with the yearly cons consumption of a US household. And maybe I go quickly back just to give you a glimpse where we are. I said 6 billion parameters transformer. So we are between the Megatron and the GBT2. All right. Um, and here the problem is that Currently, this is not the biggest issue in climate change, but it grows so quickly. And even in the uh, World Economic and Social Survey in 2018, AI is a discussion point that uh, affects um, probably climate change. And the problem with climate change is that it impacts um, all of the world, but mostly impacts um, uh, the strongest impact is on most marginalized communities. This is bad on its own, but when you then think of that those large NAP models, for example, do not perform equally well in all languages, and they're mostly focused on English and some Chinese languages, then it is it does not seem so fair <laughs> that those communities who 
probably have uh, to carry out the strongest impact on climate change, uh, profit the least, or not the least, about, but lesser than other communities. Okay, now we looked at size and we still are not uh, really at the NLP part. So I don't want to, uh, to disappoint you and start with NLP part. Um, before I do this, just uh, for your information, there's a great paper out there, which you probably heard of, and it's worth reading. It's on the dangers of stochastic parrots by Bender, Gebro, uh, Mitchell, and others. <laughs> and it's uh, really great. It's a great overview of all the different societal impacts of those uh, large language models. And one information in this paper and other papers around is that those data sets are strongly skewed against modernized groups. So I'm now talking about the data sets used for training those large language models like the English Wikipedia. And just to give an idea, um, the, for example, the English Wikipedia has 15 million times the mention, uh, the, the token or the word he is mentioned, so 50 million times. And in contrast, the word she is just mentioned 4.8 million times, which again does not seem fair. Then you can investigate the word they, and even if it's when it's used in the proof form, it still is only there with 4.9 million times, and other non-binary um, pronouns are even way lesser. Then those models, those large language models, um, were found to be toxic along dimensions like gender, race, and disability. And I will show you some examples uh, after this slide. And they are also known for producing highly toxic prompts. So when you trigger basically the right sequence, you can bring nearly any of those large language models to uh, talk racist slur, which is also highly problematic. Um, and then, as I said earlier, those models don't exist in the vacuum. Those models interact with the world. And um, the outputs of the models um, have an impact on the world. And this, in this paper by Mansouri and others, they investigate the feedback mechanism, especially in recommendation, uh, recommendation systems, which used NLP. And they basically found that um, modernized or minority groups were um, underrepresented even for being a minority group and that stereotypes were enforced. And in this in the other paper by Zhao and others in 2017, it was even shown that sometimes those models can amplify the bias of the data set. So it's not like the model is equally biased than the data set, it can even be amplified. Okay, I um, promised you some examples, and we will look at some examples. And of course, uh, we will touch the not the most comfortable, comfortable, uh, hey, uh, comfortable topics. Sorry, and uh, yeah, maybe let's just start. Safia Noble wrote a book named, uh, which is named um, Algorithms of Oppression. And the motivation from this book came when she basically, she's a professor in gender studies and she, she wanted to introduce some pictures of um, black children, in this case, black girls, just to have those more represented in her um, presentations. And when she Googled um, black girls back then in 2013, she basically was confronted with a lot of pornography. And she wondered why this is. And then she investigated more and more and basically wrote this book, of Algorithms of Oppression. And this um, experiment was repeated by the Mark Art News Incorporation in 2020. And what they found is when they looked at the recommended keywords of the Google Keyword Planner, with, um, when you input the following sequences, and then look at if those words are labeled by Google as adult content, or they would um, label some of the content as pornographic. And it's highly problematic um, 
what views are still propagated still in 2020 within uh, the Google search engine. And just to really, so there's a lot of lot to unpack here, but I want to emphasize that white girls and white boys is here something which did not introduce any pornographic material or recommended keywords which were problematic. And um, yeah, this strongly goes in the direction of um, <clears throat> racist views of this um, model and yeah, again is very problematic. Yeah, maybe we can discuss this later. Um, another example I want to show is the stereo set. The stereo set is actually um, a data set um, built by Nadim and others in 2020. And it's basically a collection of stereotypes, anti-stereotypes for different topics. And uh, then the models, the NAP models are tested on them. And uh, the, uh, the data set tests how, how much stereotype um, a model has inherited. And when we, for example, look at the GPT-2 um, and give them the type of term Saudi Arabia and the context, I heard another passenger on our plane is Saudi Arabian, um, then the model unfortunately strongly favors the stereotype version. The same is for the type of term mathematician and mathematician works at university. And um, this is something which is prominent in all the natural language processing models, especially in the large models. To sum this up a little bit, uh, there are commonly used data sets and models out there in NLP which contain harmful biases. Um, the environmental impact grows by this extreme increase in model size. And we can ask ourselves, are NLP models or those large NLP models um, probably weapons of mass destruction as defined by Katie O'Neill? And yes, they are very opaque just by the sheer size of the model and the data set. Um, they did damage, as I demonstrated to you. So this, those facts harm people, uh, those prompts or those outputs harm people, and they are applied around the globe. So the scale is also given. But of course, I won't leave you with this bad, 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 because we are in an NLP meetup. and. <laughs> I also want to hint you in another direction. Of course, you can use NLP models responsibly. And a lot of research was already done in, in analyzing and mitig uh, mitigating biases in NLP. And this is out there. This is very good, and we can profit from this. And I also have to emphasize that there are very different use cases. I can think of thousands of use cases which are totally unproblematic where NLP is used. But as soon as humans enter the equation, you probably should be more careful. And so I want to just sum this up for the development part. Um, it would be great if uh, data sets are curated, which is currently not possible with the sheer size of the data set, but somehow this data has to be anal uh, analyzed. Um, then. As I said, there is research out there. There are quite some de uh, de de devising techniques on data as well as on models. And on the development stage, also there should be a stage of thorough evaluation and documentation of model bias. And this even happens. So for example, there are model cards of GPT-2 and GPT-3 stating those problems, but one has to read them. And this immediately brings me to another point, the usage of the models. As I said, often the information is out there for those large models, but one has to read it and really think of when we use those models in our use cases. Um, then also, as I pointed out, those ethical evaluations have to be done for any specific context, so can vastly can be vastly different for different contexts. And especially be on the lookout for those nasty harmful feedback loops because they can occur over time and really make things to the worse. Before I leave you, I will just give you one last quote by Emily Bender, which is one of the researchers um, of, on the paper of 
on the dangers of stochastic periods. And she basically stated that everyone's got a responsibility in trying to say that's not my problem is being part of the uh, oh, sorry, not my problem is being part of the problem. Um, just saying we could always try our best in mitigating biases. And of course, bias will always be there, but we can try to fight it a little bit or a little bit more. And with this, uh, thank you very, very much for having me here. If you have any questions, um, you can mail me also off afterwards. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the talk of Sarah. Yeah, thank you for your presentation, Marty. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you also for this um, nice conclusion with the quote in the end. Um, I definitely have, uh, I think, tons of topics we could uh, talk about in the discussion. But first of all, I would like to give all the participants a chance. So if everybody, anybody has a has a question, um, either write it in the chat or just speak up. So there's a question in the chat already um, from Tuana. Would it one day be possible to have a model that continuously questions its own bias? Is this something that we are already thinking of in the realm of ethics in AI? Um, as far as I know, yes. So there are already devising uh, techniques um, where um, this is encoded within the loss function. So basically the model is punished if it is too unethical. So, um, yeah, there's um, one paper, I think, from Sang and others from 2017, where they um, yeah, propose such, um, such a, um, a loss function. But they are also other device, devising techniques. So you could also um, apply this on the data. So before you train the model, and you can also um, devise the output of the model. So there are several stages you can apply this. I yeah, I think I heard uh, about deviasing strategies that you can also apply like afterwards. Right? So, yeah, exactly. OK. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, maybe you can uh, post the link to that paper later on in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. There's there's one more. It's, it's kind of a question. So there is some early work being done on open source AI auditing tools, and mm -hmm. the question: Should we do more in in this regard, in this direction? Or do you know of any examples in this direction, like auditing tools? open source AI auditing tools. Maybe something that you can test models with for the bias? Yeah, but understand. for example, this uh, stereo set I um, mentioned is exactly such a thing, right? So this is really a huge data set, which is um, even at hugging face, you can download it and try a model at this. So yeah, there are um, several of those data sets, but I think this stereo set is the most prominent. Okay. And I think this direction is also quite important, especially because the social discourse is changing. And so you have to incorporate this. And um, yeah. Okay. Well, we we'll wait maybe for one more question from the audience. I think there was a recent uh, prominent example of a large language model with um, um, problems, strong problems, big problems. So uh, let's call it Galactica, right? Two weeks ago, I think it was. And then because of the big criticism, it was basically, uh, the demo was, was taken offline again. And I was wondering uh, what your thought on this is, Marty, if, if a big tech company uh, publishes such a model, um, is there anything they can do when they publish this? Um, or is it at that point already too late? Right? So can you basically explain when you publish this, it's very limited and this had, um, all these problems, or should you rather not publish it and work, work harder before making that step? Mm. It, I think it, yeah, it, it depends. So when you just say, yeah, it's not perfect, and then it's not only not perfect, but um, strongly reproduce structures like, like racism or sexism, then this isn't, is just a too shallow investigation. But when there is, uh, honest publication about this, where all these um, different problems 
are investigated and analysis uh, analyzed and showed then this is probably okay but still those problems will be there but then the communities will be informed yeah it's, just, yeah, it's a provocative question uh, i mean i think yeah, we could uh, discuss so, about that much longer yeah. you cannot i think you cannot really yeah. There are attempts for more guidelines um, on AI. This is also a quite a recent development, so that this go goes more into the focus. Um, but you probably can't forbid to, um, a company to publish um, some new ever-growing transformer. Um, but uh, you can ask this company that it should provide information how yeah, how people could be harmed by this. Okay, is there another question from the audience? If not, then I'd say um, feel free to ask your question still in the chat, while we already um, jump to the to the next talk. So yeah, thanks, Marty, again. And now let's come to the second talk of, of tonight. So it's a talk by Sarah about uh, practical introduction to image retrieval. And Sarah is a NLP engineer at DeepSet. Um, previously, she worked, uh, I think, for three years at uh, CERN. So um, you know them by these uh, large Heldron uh, colliders, right? So again, maybe some, some physics uh, connection here. And But today it's about images, and I'm very much looking forward to the presentation because it does not need to be always about text, right? It can also be about images. Sarah, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Julian. So indeed, as you mentioned, I'm Sarah Dantotera. So I work for DeepSense since about one year right now. And today we're going to talk a little bit about how to do practical image retrieval with Haystack. So this is a very practical introduction. We are not going to go too much into the details of like the models or the like technical theoretical approaches. We're going to do it very hands-on. Indeed, this presentation is going to be half about introducing the problem a bit. And then we're gonna do some live coding. So indeed, we're gonna cover four points here. First of all, we're gonna frame a bit what the problem with image retrieval is. We're gonna talk a little bit about clip to set the stage for what comes next. Then we're gonna see about what Haystack can do, like how can it help us to build a, an image retrieval system based on clip. And then we're gonna open a collab, collab notebook, an empty one, and we're gonna build up this system on the fly. So, okay, first of all, let's talk a little bit about the problem. Searching text is generally kind of an e easy problem to grasp, let's say. You've got words, you've got sentences, you can search for keywords. For example, there are algorithms that help you, uh, help you like search through text. There is PFIDF, there is PM25. So there are a lot of approaches to searching text. But how about searching images? Like images are not as easy to search because the meaning of them is encoded in the pixel in a way that is really not obvious especially from, from a coding perspective. So how do you do this? To be able to search images, you not only need to understand the image, you need to understand both text and images. Indeed, when you do image search, you need a model that is able to compare a sentence or like a noun, for example, a sleeping cat with images of cats that might be doing different things. So a really good system is able to take the sentence, a sleeping cat, take pictures of cats, and then make resulting representation of them that are much more similar between the cat that is actually sleeping with respect to the image of a cat that is doing something else. So just to give a little bit of terminology that might come up later, these representations are also called embeddings, and we're going to see them later. They are going to probably pop up while we do the live coding, just in case you didn't know. OK, here I just mentioned the model. but which model we use. One of the most common models, most famous models that used for this problem is CLIP. CLIP is a neural network that is trained on image text pairs. So it kind of acts as a bridge between computer vision and NLP. It does accept prompts in the natural language and images. And what it does is that it's able, as mentioned before, to compare them and to check how similar they are. To do a very trivial example in here, you can give CLIP images of cats and dogs, and the string cat and the string dog. And when he compares them, he's gonna, he's gonna be able to tell you that cat 
is much, much more similar to the previous, to the first image than with the second, while dog is much more similar to the second than to the first. So he's already able to do this. This is very basic comparison. But a very good feature of Clip is that it's not only able to compare cats with cats, but it's also able to predict how close semantically are some images that is never seen before with text that is never seen before. So even if Clip is never been trained to spot, I don't know, the, the color of an, and the, the eyes of an animal, if you give it the same yellow eyes, Clip is still gonna be able to tell you that the first picture actually matches way better because Clip has a kind of a general understanding of what eyes are, what yellow is, and then they can combine these two concepts together, both on the image point of view and from this, the text point of view. So it's still gonna be able to tell you that the first one is much more closer to the text yellow eyes than the second, while black eyes matches, matches much better the second picture. Same you can imagine with ears, for example, an even far, more far-fetched example. It's unlikely that this pair was given during training, but again, clip is going to be able to kind of abstract the concept that, that they meet in the string and, and in the images and still do some good matching here. Why is this so important? Actually, this is important because these capabilities, which is called like the zero shot, is very useful because it allows clip to match, his disc, to match descriptions with pictures. So for example, if I have a picture of a cheetah here, it doesn't only match with cheetah, but it also matches with its description. Like for example, a very fast big cat. Clip knows what a cat is, knows what a big cat is, what knows probably that the cheetahs are very fast. So this one, okay, kind of matches the view. Also, if I was writing, I don't know, a spotted big cat, this was also match because it's got spots, it's a big cat, so again, you can combine description using these zero shot capabilities, and that's very useful when you're just searching through a data set of images. Now let's talk quickly about Haystack. So why do we need this? Haystack is an NLP framework, and it's generally built, it's generally aimed at building pipelines for search. So it can build a question answering pipeline, FQA matching, document retrieval, or image retrieval, as we're gonna use it for today. And the good part of it is that it's very modular. So it, it's basically an umbrella above a series of other open source projects. For example, Hugging Face Transformers, which we're gonna use for Clip, or Elasticsearch, or Vector Data Store, like Milbo's VD8 on Pinecon. So you can use several technologies under the same umbrella. So unified API, easier to switch in, switch out. So it's a very good tool for prototyping and for production as well. So introduction is over. Let's go a bit towards the code. First of all, let's see what we are building today. So the data set in here, it's a collection of pictures from the Lisbon Zoo, okay? I live in Lisbon right now, I've been at the zoo, I know which animals there are in there, so I know what is gonna be in this data set, more or less. The image come from Wikimedia and they have different varying quality. For example, some are very, very high quality, like they're made by photographers, I suppose. Some others come from visitors of the zoo, so they are a bit like less refined size is different, quality is different. So yeah, a bit of a variety does it here. It's not too big, it's about 500 images and includes indeed most of the animals that are in this. So in detail, what we are going to do now is the following. You can see a little summary in here in the graph. The, the system we're gonna build look like this. So first of all, we're gonna install Haystack. Then we're gonna create a document store. A document store is a, is a Haystack module node that uh, basically manages your data. So it will, in case of text, it will uh, like index the text. In case of images, it will keep track of your images. And in this case, we're gonna populate the document store indeed with the images of the data set I just mentioned before. After this, we're gonna create a retriever. The retriever is the, part, is the node in this case that contains the model. In this case, it will contain a clip model from Hacking Face. Uh, after we create a document store and retriever, we can connect them together. And at that point, we already have a system that is ready to take a query like a penguin and get you an image of a penguin out from the data set. Keep in mind that again, we cannot look for any exotic animal because it has to be an animal that is in the zoo. So here we go. Let's open the colon notebook and let's see if we can manage to make it work. So let's see. Okay, so here we have the steps again. And uh, just let me check if the runtime is good. Okay, I'm on GPU just to speed it up. 
But I tested it on CPU, and as long as you have a decent machine, this should run on CPU, no problem. In a few minutes, it should be, it should be able to run from top to bottom. Also, this notebook is going to be shared along with a slide at the end of the presentation. So you can probably test it again at home or indeed play with it a bit more. So first of all, we're going to install HSTEP. One of the first steps is to upgrade PIP because unfortunately, Colab doesn't come with the, the latest version. And then we install farm HSTEP. Not with a capital letter. Even that we are on Colab, we're going to install the Colab Extra, but this is not required if you're doing it on your laptop. All right, that, that step is going to take a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and like prepare the following step already. We are now going to get the data set. So luckily, ASTRAC gives us the tools for this. Uh, archive from HTTP. This little function here is just a little utility that we will use to download uh, the data set. Data set is just a zip file, so you can get it in any other way as well. But that is a, it's quite handy, so we're going to use that one. This is the link, and we're going to give it the URL in here, and then the output directory, which I don't know, I cannot call it data set. All right, so when Haystack is going to be installed, we can, ooh, yeah, fast. Okay, we can probably now run the second step. This should uh, quickly download the data set as well. Should be a bit faster, a few more seconds. All right, looks good. So we should be able to go ahead. Now, step three was to create the document store. Creating document store is also very easy. So from Haystack document stores, document stores, import in memory. So I'm choosing this one specifically because it's very lightweight and uh, it works on Colab the best. There are several others way more powerful, so you can you can choose like more powerful one if you're doing, for example, a larger data set. This one is good for, for prototypes. And this is also very easy to initialize because you just do store in memory document store. Yes. And in a lot of cases, this will be sufficient. In the case of clip, instead, you have to give an extra parameter, which is embedding them equal 512. The issue here is that the in-memory document store will assume by default that you have text, text documents, which in this case is not true because we're using images. And images, in the case of clip, have a different embedding size and text. This is a typical information that you can find uh, on, the, on the model card on Hugging Face. So depending on which retriever you're attaching to this document story, you might want to check what is the embedding dimension and see if you want to specify it in here. So, okay, check is green. We can move ahead and populate the document store. So the download was successful. Let's see what we have, what we have downloaded. Import this, and let's just have a look. This here. We should be able to see a folder at least. No such directory. Data set. Data set. <laughs> of course, it had to not work while I was doing the live presentation. Let me try to download it again. Let's list here. All right. Let's try again. Ah, nice. Okay, cool. So now we have the folder. Let's see. This from zoo should contain our images. Nice. Okay, so we have a few. We can actually see what they contain. I don't know. Let's take a random one. And let's try to, to do that. By the way, let's save the, the path. So I don't know. Look here. It's going to be data set. 
this so maybe I can reuse this one. All right. And then what I can do is I can import item display import image. And now I should be able to see something. Image, I don't know. So here plus and the path I copied. All right, let's have a look what we have uh, from this. Let's see what we've got. <laughs> of course. Nice. Okay, cool. So we got some dolphins. Sounds nice. Let's move on. Okay, so we have pictures. We we have all of them, and now we can actually put them in the document store. Now, how do we do this? It's pretty easy because first of all, you got to create document objects. Document store, store what are called documents, and you import them like this. Okay, we start import document, and then you will create one document for each of the images we have. So docs is gonna be like from. I name in what's this here? How did I call it? Doc steer. Doc steer. Okay. Okay. I will create a document object whose content is going to be the file name. So it's going to be doc here. Plus slash and then the file name. Okay. In addition to giving the document the path to the, to the image, we're gonna run, we're gonna have to tell it that this is an image, so not text. Indeed, Haystack can handle images, can handle text, can handle table and audio as well. So when you create a document, usually you specify which kind of content it has. All right. So this is not from, this is for. Okay, so this should be good. And now once you have your documents, we're gonna write them in the documents. So doc store, write documents. And you give it the document. Should be all right. Okay, cool. After this, just to make sure that everything went well, we can actually ask the doc store how many Documents it contains. Get document count. It should be about 500 pictures. And indeed, it's 504. So, okay, seems like we put all our images in the document store in the proper format, and document store is happy. So, this step is over. We can, we can move on into making the retriever. The retriever is just another haystack node. So, from haystack again, from haystack nodes, import multimodal. Okay, this retriever is called multimodal retriever because it's specifically built to handle like multimodal search. So not only text to text or image to image, but in the text to image or even like more, more different combinations, for example. This is also pretty easy to initialize. You can create a retriever object. And say, retriever. The retriever will need three parameters. First of all, we need a doc store. The document store, which will give it the reference to the doc store we created above, our in memory that contains the pictures. Then it wants query embedding model, which in this case is going to be clip. And then it also wants to know how to embed the documents because there are some use cases in which you want the documents and the query to be embedded by different models. However, in this case specifically, it can do both. So we're gonna specify that the documents are gonna be images and that we also want it in here. All right, so multimodal retriever, this is all it needs to be, to be set up. And this should also work. 
So it's going to take a bit longer to be created because uh, the model has to be downloaded from hanging phase. So indeed, we see like download is going. Seems like it's going well. OK, now let's go ahead a little bit while the download is in progress. We can start uh, like to create the embeddings for the images. So uh, in general, document store can store the images, but can also like store their representation. What you want to do when you build an image search or any search system, to be, on, to be honest, is that the document store will already contain the representations. This will make the search process way faster because that means that during search, you only have to create the representation for the query, and then you can compare, compare it with the existing representation of all the images or text you, you have into your data set. So after you write the content, you also pre-prepare pre all, the, all the embeddings. So when come time for search, they're going to be ready. In this case, this is also very, sim very simple because it's a stock store. Update embeddings. There we go. And you give it the retriever. So the document store knows which retriever is going to be used at search, and it can create proper embeddings for this. All right, so maybe let's wait for the download to be, to be done so we can make sure this step goes. This actually, the update embeddings is one of the most, uh, most time consuming in general, usually because you have a lot of data in the document store. In this case, especially on GPU, it's gonna take one minute maximum. So let's see how long it takes. Usually during test, it was taking 30 seconds at most. But uh, on CPU as well, it can take one, two minutes, so for a small data set, this is actually manageable. If you have larger data set, then you have to account for more resources. OK, cool. Why? Wow, it was done in 15 seconds. Very nice. OK, so actually, this is all we need from our system. At this point, we're ready for query. So what we do is that we have our retriever, and we do retrieve. We say query. I don't know, a giraffe. We can also specify that we want just one result to begin with to see what comes out. And we save the result in here. And then we can print it to see what's inside. Actually, retriever, even if you specify top K1, always, always returns a list. So for R result, yeah, print R. So we see what's inside in here. This should be fairly quick. OK, nice. So our retriever decided that this document is the most, the most fitting one for our query. We have no idea what it contains, so let's try to see what's inside. Uh, for example, we can do image r, no, uh, zero, because that's a list. Then we can use the content field, which in this case contains the path. We should be good to go. And yeah, a giraffe. OK, nice. So Clip clearly knows what a giraffe is. Let's go for something a bit more creative now. Now the system is set up, we can, we can go wild. For example, let's be vague. A marine mammal. We've seen there were dolphins before, so at least one picture of dolphins should be available. And that fits the bill. So let's see if we can find it. OK, not a dolphin, but a marine mammal it is. So I guess that. That's fine. Uh, let's see something else. Yes, let's try to describe an animal instead. Like, I don't know. I know that there are flamingos at the zoo. So we can say an animal with pink feathers. They should, this should definitely be a flamingo or I don't know, a parrot at most. So yeah, OK. That, that is a flamingo. Sounds good. We can even see if we can get a picture where we see a better flamingo because this is just just the pink feathers of it, if you want to be to be very accurate. So, so let's see, I don't know, I say top K3 and I get the second image. Okay, second image also flamingo. I can see the third image. Hopefully there are more than two pictures of flamingo in here. Yeah, okay, nice. So we have several pictures. We found three flamingos at the first three results. So, okay, I call it good. However, so far, We've been describing the animals. So we've been we've been like uh, listing features that they can be seen in the picture. However, if you read the description for this talk, the question I wanted to ask this model was 
what's the fastest animal in the world? And this is a very tough question because indeed, like you cannot see in a picture if an animal is fast or not. And indeed, as I figured out in my test later, if you ask it, the fastest animal in the world, I know there are cheetahs in the zoo, but unfortunately, Clip in this case is very much convinced that it's a zebra of some sort. It always returns a zebra. Even the top one, most likely, it's going to be one. Let's see. Yes, yes, yes. Clip is really convinced that zebras are extremely fast, which unfortunately is not true. Uh, however, like, can we do something about it? Like, this is not great. And yet, like, Clip is a very nice state of the art model. So, what we can do about it? Can we do something? Actually, yes. So, actually, this is thanks to Haystack. We can uh, make other models help Clip with this task. Now, let's imagine a system that works like this. I give a description of an animal. I don't know, the fastest animal in the world or something like this. Of course, like, Clip cannot tell, but for example, a model like Bird can go read Wikipedia, figure out like that Wikipedia contains this information and actually find it in a bigger document, in a bigger, uh, in a bigger document store. For example, we index Wikipedia in a document store and then this query goes first to Bird and then Bird will return you the answer. And the answer is gonna be cheetah. At the point, the string cheetah, instead of going out as your, as the result, we go directly to clip. And at the point, clip has an easy game figuring out what you want because, okay, Bert actually act as an intermediary between what you wanted to know, which was already needed Wikipedia to understand, and then what you actually want to see. So eventually, at this point, clip will know exactly what you want. You will go through the images, you will find the cheetah, and then it will return you the actual picture. This sounds very hard, but indeed, it is really not so with Haystack. I put together a bit more complicated example in here. This is simplified, so it does not really go look for Wikipedia. As you can see, I copy pasted one of the snippets, but you can actually build a question answering system first on Wikipedia with using uh, using the Haystack tutorials or the Haystack examples, which is gonna, look, gonna be looking pretty much like this in lengthwise. And indeed, if you run it, you can actually get the proper answer out. Just to be clear, Wikipedia does not tell specifically the cheetah is the fastest. It also mentioned that peregrine falcon are extremely fast. There are very fast insects out here. But indeed, Bert is smart enough to figure out that you want an animal, a land animal, and then returning you the cheetah. So yes, apparently you can use Haystack to enhance the capabilities of existing model by combining them together. OK, so as a closing word in here, I wanted to mention a little bit of a little possible application that you can imagine for a system like this. The first of all that comes to mind is e-commerce. I mean, the idea of being able to search through catalogs of product images by just describing them is very powerful because right now searching through catalog always required on product metadata, which has to be kept, uh, kept in sync, manually updated, et cetera, which is a very labor intensive process. If you could just upload the picture of the images and then uh, your search system could automatically figure out what it represents, that would be a big win, and that would actually improve a lot also the results. For example, if a user is, uh, user is looking for, I don't know, a light blue dress with a daisy pattern, I mean, you have to be very careful with the metadata to be able to search for this thing. While Clip can actually look at the dress, okay, it's blue, it has daisies on it, so it's probably a good match, and return it first. So this can be very powerful for e-commerce catalogs and, and stuff like this, but it can also be used to search effectively through any imaginable vast archive of images. So for example, historical archives, which rarely have a uh, very detailed metadata or medical collections or satellite images, or even industrial monitoring, like when you have a lot of pictures about, I don't know, the output of 3D printers or the states of assembly lines, quality controls, whatever requires, whatever has images as their main data source, it can be probably helped a lot with a system like this. Okay, so this was the end of the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, just uh, just yeah, write them in the chat and Julian will, will speak them out. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much for this uh, very engaging uh, presentation. 
I'm sure I'm not the only one eager um, to drive it out, being eager to drive it out. So I think there was already the request for a, a notebook and there was another comment, how brave you are to do this live coding with this <laughs> uh, environment that you just set up. So uh, super great to see that. Um, now let's see whether there are any, any questions already besides uh, how can someone be so brave? <laughs> um, yeah, any questions? Thank you. So you already mentioned it, right? Uh, we will post the link to the notebook, then also with a YouTube recording, I'd say, right? Together with a video recording. Um, uh, yeah, honestly, that's... the lack of questions is very nice. That <laughs> it was clear. <laughs> so there's one question. Can this, be combine, can this combine two models together? For example, a text and image model. Um, yeah, so this, this is a question. Somebody maybe... Yeah. Um, had like difficulties and uh, understanding how this works with text and images. Yeah, so two yeah. models or just one. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So like, uh, let me maybe go quickly back to the diagram. Yes. So let, let's highlight in here that Haystack will keep, will use the two models separately. We just um, use them one after the other. So the two models are separate. They have each one their own retriever. So they don't really know each other. They are really isolated. What Haystack does is that Basically, it simplifies the fact of connecting one to the other. So, for example, BERT will do what every BERT in the world does. So it will take a question and return you an answer after searching through, through the dataset collection. While CLIP will only get a very simple prompt, which is the output of BERT, and then actually return you images. So the two models will stay isolated. They are not merged in any way. They, they have do, do each one their own job. And uh, they they just appear as uh, like uh, as like together once you put them together with haystack. I hope that clarified it a bit. <laughs> Thank you. There was another question about a, a model like an alternative to clip, and the question is whether you had experience uh, with uh, lit, so it's a locked image text something uh, from from Google. It's just in like a similar model, I think, to clip. Um, yeah. Did okay. you try it out? Actually, not too much. I've been uh, mostly mostly experimenting with Clip lately, but um, in theory, nothing prevents you from trying this with this exact setup and just change uh, the, the the model name. So, for example, let's see if I can go back to the to the caller. I think I have the yeah I have the fallback slides, so we can go check those. Uh, but I was not that confident that would work. <laughs> So yes, in here in the multimodal retriever, what you can do to try out another uh, another model is just to replace this string. As long as it comes from sentence transformer or it has the implementation of hugging face, you can try that out and see if it works. It should. So yeah, this is another another of the beauty of Haystack that you can just really change the models and do minimal adjustments to the rest of the component, and usually stuff works out of the box. So it's very nice. But yeah, personally, didn't have much much experience with it. There's a different question about enforcing factual accuracy. So the question goes, uh, how would you go about enforcing that uh, accuracy, like facts, that facts are, are like correct, are correctly understood by the model or represented? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to query resources like knowledge graphs to get that facts uh, ah, yeah, in the okay. model? OK, actually, yes. So you can, you can decide like how the pipeline looks like, depending on how accurate you want the output to be. So in this case, for example, I just put a bird there that just goes looking in uh, any text database. But if you have a, like a knowledge graph, there are like knowledge, knowledge graph document stores that can actually query knowledge graphs instead of querying, I don't know, text. So indeed, yes, you can replace that step with a more accurate one if you, if you have an idea on how to make that better or if you have models that, uh, that do like this specific correctness check. The pipeline is here are very flexible. You can even do like several steps. You can first have a pass with BERT, and then you can later have a check with your knowledge graph. And then once you're confident that the thing makes sense, then you can pass it over to CLIP, or you can do it in reverse. The thing is really, the architecture here is can be can be completely changed. It's very flexible. So yes, it is totally possible. 
And then I read out one more question before going into the breakout rooms, uh, where we have, of course, more time for questions. So um, it's about the annotation uh, for uh, data for these uh, models. So the question is, can the Haystack annotation tool be used along with this in order to improve one model or maybe use one model to improve the other? I think it's yeah about how to improve these models. Can, can annotations help? Yeah. Okay, interesting. Okay, specifically for text to image, not yet. Like uh, right now, there is no support for training or fine tuning, uh, not in Haystack at least. So you can probably do it like outside of the tool, but personally, I don't have too much experience with that. Regardless, as I said, with the like text to text models, like in the BERT, yeah, that's definitely something that you can do. So you can use the annotation tool to create some data set for fine tuning. And then Haystack offers you the facilities to do like extra training, fine tuning, domain adaptation, and, and similar, similar adjustments. So yes, that is totally possible for text to text, not yet for text to image. All right. Yeah, then thanks again for the great talk. And I'll start the breakout rooms.